Hey everyone, my name is Dave Pluff. Welcome into my class, to my lecture series. Today's lecture is the roles of the artist. And no matter which class you're taking from me, whether it's an intro to art, art appreciation class, whether it's a survey one or two, or whether it's a more specialized class, like the history of modern art, everyone begins here. So we're all kind of at the same level. We're gonna be walking through the roles of the artist and what roles they fulfill in today's society. It's a great intro lecture. If you've never learned about art before, this gives you kind of wading into the shallow end of the pool type of situation where we start to learn some artists' names and some artworks and some things about them. So let's go ahead and begin the lecture, Roles of the Artist. Now, even before I delve into the lecture, what I normally do in an in-class experience is to talk to my students about what is art. And we have this very short exercise where I have them spend two minutes just writing down individual words or terms that can define art. So that's what I would like you to do right now. Go ahead and pause the video and come up with as many single words as you can to define art. Pretend that you're trying to define it to someone who has no idea what art is. Okay, I'm gonna assume you stopped the video, made a short list of words that can define art. Here are some of the terms that my past students and myself have come up with. And this is what makes the study of art so incredible. And one of the reasons I love teaching this subject is that art can mean different things to different people. Art can be passion, intellect, and expression. It can be both beautiful and ugly. It can be both religious and political. It can serve as propaganda. Art is subjective, it's emotional, it can be offensive. And especially in the terms of street art, art can be illegal. So this is really just a, a small list of terms that can define this word. I also love the study of art because we are the ones that get to decide whether something is or isn't art. It's not a universal rule that, for instance, painting is art. But when we deal with painting, this is definitely a category that people talk about when we are dealing with art. The same thing with sculpture, both painting and sculpture, as well as drawing is something we've done as a human race since prehistoric times. The very first drawings date back to like 33,000 BC. But what happens when we get to photography? Photography is our newest artistic medium. And this is something that causes a lot of controversy and we'll deal with this more in a photography lecture. But when I think about people being able to actually create art, drawing or painting, maybe 5%, maybe 10%, of my class can actually, if I told them to draw a bird, they can actually draw a bird. But if I ask people, can you photograph? The answer is undoubtedly yes. Everyone, 100% of my students can photograph. Well, what makes it art then? Because this is much more of a mechanical process and we'll deal with issues like this later on in the semester. We also have architecture, and in this case with Falling Water, this falls into the category of modern architecture, which is one of my favorite subjects. So this is something that I definitely consider art. But what happens when we get to things like this, which I would generally throw out expletives in class because this is incredibly hideous, it's weird, it's different, it's ugly, but this is a really important work of art. But it's also an artwork that makes me mad because an artist isn't involved. 
This is a work of art that cost the museum over $400,000 to purchase. And the importance of it is that it is our very first kinetic sculpture, which we'll deal with more in the motion lecture if you're taking Art 101 with me. But this wheel is basically uh, inverted and installed into a milking stool. And in 1913, we have our very first kinetic sculpture. Oh, and it gets worse. Think about this gigantic spoon with a cherry on top that serves as a fountain in Minneapolis. Or this work here of an Angora goat with a tire around its waist. Couture and textiles definitely can fall into the category of art. I spent a couple years working in the Department of Costume and Textile at the LA County Museum of Art. So this is uh, an object that I am definitely going to categorize as art. But think of how textile is used here, where it's basically a 15 foot tall wall of textiles stretched for 27 miles in Northern California back in the 1970s. And here we've got 400 stainless steel poles out in the desert in New Mexico, capable of conducting lightning. One of my favorite artworks, candy, and it is like a gift from God because it is interactive. And the museum or gallery where this work is refills it every single day so you can continue to take the candy. Would you consider this to be art? This is an artwork that was done in a studio here in Southern California, uh, specifically Santa Ana. And the artist at the left there in the left image, Chris Burden, has his friend at the right, just back from Vietnam, shoot him in the arm. And this is an artwork that catapulted Chris Burden into fame. But a lot of people, uh, they couldn't get over the violence that this work entailed. But Chris Burden says that this work isn't about violence, it's about anticipation. And we'll deal with this in the performance art lecture uh, later on. Uh, but Chris Burden is also the person that gave us this work here, uh, the lights out in front of the LA County Museum of Art, which is one of the most famous spots in Southern California, a great uh, location for all those Instagram pictures. One other exercise I have students complete in class is by taking this artwork here and writing a paragraph or two about it. It's just free writing for you and it's never turned in or no points assigned to it, but it's the idea of beginning to learn how to write about art because that's something that for many of us, we've never thought about doing before and we're not even quite sure the correct terms or even where to start. So if you want to spend about seven, eight minutes doing that, please do so. I'm going to go ahead and move on to some notes regarding the lectures that you'll have in this class. And the first thing is, especially if this is your first art history class, and especially if you're taking an intro class, don't get too caught up into the titles, artists, or dates of the artwork. Knowing those are nice, but what's more important is the understanding of the concept or idea that is being presented in the lectures. Titles, artists, dates can be looked up. They do become more important as you continue your study of art history. If you're taking a survey class, if you're taking an upper division specialty class, such as the history of modern art, but in an intro class, Really, it is focusing on concepts, ideas, and topics. The same can be said for definitions. Whether you can memorize a definition or not doesn't really matter. But what's important is that knowing the terminology enough to apply it to a work of art. For instance, on an exam, I'm going to put up a work of art and I'm going to ask you, is this 
or is this not in linear perspective, as an example? I need you to tell me whether it's in perspective or not. You have to know enough about perspective to be able to explain it and tell me what it is. But other than that, word for word definition memorization doesn't really matter as much. It's all about application. Never allow the amount of information presented in the lectures to overwhelm you. Do not try to write down everything being said. What I do, if you're taking a class from me, is I provide study guides. They are located on Canvas. There's a study guide for each and every lecture. It contains both terminology and imagery. And that is generally what you're going to be tested on. Do they have all the terms and images on an exam? No, but they probably have 90% of them. So it is essential that you utilize those study guides. For most classes, they're also supported by a textbook. And then in the back of the textbook, there is a glossary that has all the definitions written out for you. If you are taking a zero textbook cost class where we have readings to do, all the definitions can easily be looked up online. You can also reach out to me and of course all the definitions are going to be in the lectures as well. The opinions that I express during class are just that. They're my opinions. Whether you agree with them or disagree with them, that's totally cool. But don't let them influence you. Don't think you should like or dislike a work of art because I do. I'm a person who's just going to tell you their opinion. I'm going to tell you like it is. So I don't sugarcoat things. I just kind of say what I want to say. With that in mind, though, some of the statements that I'm going to make during class are going to differ from my true feelings and thoughts about the subject matter. The idea is that they're said to encourage debate, maybe taking the opposite stance of an accepted viewpoint. And that way it creates some debate, it creates some argument, it creates some interaction, and most importantly, it makes you think. All right, so we're finally at our first artwork. This is uh, an artwork called The Gates, and it's by the artist couple Christo and his wife, Jean-Claude. Now, keep in mind when we refer to artists, we always refer to them either by their full name, for instance, Pablo Picasso, or their last name, Picasso. Very rarely do we get by with giving their first name. You don't ever hear Pablo Picasso being referred to as Pablo. However, people like Michelangelo, Raphael, Rembrandt, and Christo, they're more commonly known by their first name. So I'm going to take you back in time a little bit. This is 2005 when this artwork was created and it is located in New York City. This is Central Park and there's a little bit more of a close up of what a gate is. They're 16 feet tall. They're massive structures, seven foot tall so you can walk underneath them. And the artist, his wife, their workers created 7,503 of these. They spaced them roughly 12 feet apart. And if you do the math, it's about 17 miles of pathway. Would you consider this art from the definitions we just created? Here's some more information. The artwork was on display for two weeks. That's it, 14 days, and after that it was taken down. When is art ever ephemeral? When we think about artworks like the Mona Lisa, the Mona Lisa has been around for like nearly 600 years, and I'm not in a hurry to go and see the Mona Lisa because I know it's gonna be there next summer and the summer after that and the decade after that, but if you, delayed your trip to New York, you would have missed this artwork. 
In the two weeks that this artwork was on display, over four million visitors came to see this work, including one of my office mates who said this was like one of the most incredible experiences of her life. After the artwork was concluded, these works were taken down. Uh, the uh, cloth themselves uh, was cut up and, and sold. Other parts were recycled. And the cost of this artwork was an amazing $21 million. And that was like 20 years ago. What's interesting also is that money came from the artists. This is not taxpayer money. There's no sponsorships. There's not a banner that says Coca-Cola. The artwork was paid for by the artists. Now, one of the art critics at the time wrote that this work jars us out of our complacency. And I believe that to be true. Because if you lived near Central Park and frequented this location, it's kind of like walking across campus. The first day you walk across campus, you notice all sorts of things. The second day, you notice a little bit less. And by the fifth or sixth week of school, when you walk from one side of the campus to the other, you don't even remember what you saw. You're just so used to it. But all of a sudden, these artists place these saffron colored banners all throughout the park and it made people stop and look around again and re-examine their surroundings and the landscape so that's like the meaning of this work that's why it's so important i'm not a big fan of it personally i think it's because of the color although these people look like they're having a blast there kind of looks like to me Home Depot like exploded all over Central Park but it does look very stunning up against the white snow so what this artwork does is it fulfills that first role of the artist and that first role of the artist is that artists help us see the world in new and innovative ways And it's totally cool to pause the video to write that down. But I'm going to go ahead and move on to another artist that fulfills this role. Again, artists help us see the world in new and innovative ways. And that next artist is Robert Smithson. And this is one of my favorite works. This is the Spiral Jetty. And it extends into the Great Salt Lake in Utah. If you unfurled it, it would be about 1,500 feet in length. It's near the very top of the lake and about 45 minutes out of the town of Corinne. Corinne is famous because it is where the Transcontinental Railroad met, and that's where the Golden Spike Museum is. And from Corinne, you drive about 45 minutes out in the middle of nowhere. This is a very secluded location. You park up in this parking lot, and there's actually a sign that says Spiral Jetty that way. You get down to the base of the Spiral Jetty, and there's another sign that says, please don't walk on the art. But you hop over it, and you walk on the art, because you just drove 45 minutes to do just that. Robert Smithson chose the spiral form because he said it was the most fundamental form in nature, that everything from DNA molecules to galaxies had this spiral shape to it. The spiral jetty is fun for me because it's an artwork that has backfired. The spiral jetty, after it was completed, sunk. It basically uh, was submerged by the rising waters of the Great Salt Lake. Today, not only has the water receded, and also around this area of the lake, there is a bacteria in the water that turns the water kind of pink in color. We've got some salt deposits here along the spiral jetty. But today, the water has receded so far, there's not even any water around the spiral jetty. It's like 20, 30 feet away from it. So 
it looks a lot different today than what it was meant to. Unfortunately, Robert Smithson is going to be killed in a plane crash right after this work is completed. Uh, it's completed around 1970. Uh, this is also around the same time as the environmentalist movement, and it is land art, earth art, environmental art. All those terms are synonymous. But because of his early death, he becomes a cult-like figure to us in art history. And a lot of us make pilgrimages out to his works. Other works that he created, Broken Circle. And if you're standing right here and you pan to the left, you're going to have another of his artworks called Spiral Hill. Asphalt Rundown, which looks like a pretty silly artwork because it's basically an asphalt truck that's been dumped down this hill. But for me, I'm really big into science. My background before art was science. I liked everything, you know, measured and theories and formulas and things like that. And when I took art, I was amazed that, you know, art could have multiple outcomes and outcomes could change over the history of art. But this artwork particularly is cool because it deals with scientific principles such as entropy. And he also does that with this can of glue. So let's go ahead and move on to the second role of the artist. So this first paragraph you don't need to write down. I'm going to show you a translation that'll be much easier in just a moment. But the second role of the artist is that artists make a visual record of the people, places, and events of their time and place. What does this mean? It means that artists record the world. And for me, this is what I need an artist to do. I love the idea of the artist documenting the world. An example of this is the burning of the Houses of Parliament, which is an event that took place in 1835, four years before the invention of photography. Now today, a lot of the documentation that we have is taking the form of pictures or video. Back in the day, we don't have that, so we're relying on the artist to preserve that moment in time. J.M.W. Turner lived nearby ran to the top of a hill, sketched out the scene before him, and over the next six months produced several of these paintings that memorialize this event. And I don't know about you, but for me, I would much rather look at this image and kind of like it feels like I'm there at the event rather than reading about it in text in a book somewhere. When you see this individual here, who is this person? And a lot of times we'll like immediately be able to recognize these individuals in these artworks. And especially with the hat that is sideways on this guy, we know he's Napoleon. And Napoleon, uh, if we went up to heaven today and we ran into this guy, we'd be all, hey, Napoleon, how's it going? And Napoleon would look at us and go like, how do you know who I am? I was on this earth like 200 years before you were. And you could say, well, it's because an artist documented what you look like in a painting. And we can identify these figures several hundred years after they lived. And I would also tell you Napoleon did not make it to heaven. I will tell you that story in another uh, video on art theft. But keep in mind as well, art back in the day is a lot different than art today. Back in the day, art is very expensive. So you have a very limited amount of people who are going to be in paintings, such as leaders of the military, leaders of the government, people like Napoleon and George Washington, you're also going to have leaders of the church, such as Pope Julius II. We'll see him in a later lecture because he is 
the probably the most important pope during the Renaissance. He's the one who brought Michelangelo to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in 1508. He's also the person who brought Raphael to paint his personal apartments right next to the Sistine Chapel. Um, the idea is that when you become Pope, one of the first things you do is you redecorate. We're going to talk about the School of Athens, which is the image at the right in our Renaissance lecture. And of course, wealthy families are going to be able to afford artworks. Lady Agnew, her husband, was a member of the Scottish Parliament. It's not going to be until the 1860s where people like you and I are going to be in art. Uh, the modernists, such as uh, Renoir, uh, he and Monet and Mary Cassatt, Edgar Degas, they make up the Impressionists. And it's real common to see everyday people in everyday scenes in their artworks. That was their focus. Prior to them, paintings were about the past and events like the Last Supper or the Last Judgment. But when we get to the modern art age, it's really about the here and now. It's not going to be until 1885 where you start to have paintings of the poor, the working class, the laborers as the main subject matter. And this is one of the reasons Vincent van Gogh is so important in the history of art. So we're going to deal also with him in a later lecture. So we've talked about events, we've talked about people, let's talk about places. So the Rocky Mountains is a painting done in 1863, and it was showcased on the East Coast. And it really kind of served as propaganda to support the westward expansion. And if we go back to 1863, we're in the middle of the Civil War. In the East Coast, you're probably in the middle of the winter. You've got a lot of snow, a lot of cold weather. Look at how beautiful this painting is. It's the idea of bringing people out to the West. But we know the West doesn't look like this. This is kind of someone's romanticized version of it. We have this beautiful uh, hillside with snow-capped mountains. We've got blue sky, clouds sailing by. We've got a beautiful lake and almost an audible quality from that waterfall. We have animals playfully interacting with Indians in the foreground. Everything is lush, it's green, it's serene. But our problem is those are not the Rocky Mountains. Albert Bierstadt had never been to the West Coast. He had never seen the Rocky Mountains, but he had seen the Swiss Alps. And so he painted an image of the Matterhorn. Not that Matterhorn this Matterhorn. And so we also have to keep in mind the truthfulness when it comes to art. So the third role of the artist is that artists give form to the immaterial. And where I think that second role of the artist to record the world, to provide documentation, is the most essential, I think the third role is the most difficult. How do you create something that doesn't exist? Examples of the immaterial, and you do not need to write this down, but it's hidden or universal truths, spiritual forces, and personal feelings. How do you go about painting an image that showcases like, or love, or hate? It's really difficult. And artists are kind of tasked with the impossible. And we'll kind of see that throughout the lectures during the first half of the course. But how would you go about creating an image if someone wanted a painting of God? We don't know what God looks like, but in the early 1400s, Jan van Eyck comes up with this image of God. And this is a panel from the Ghent altarpiece. We'll see that again later in the semester. But it's a lot different than probably what we thought God looked like. A more common image is Michelangelo's creation of Adam, 
where you've got it at the top of the Sistine ceiling. It's the middle panel. It's the most famous. And we have a much different interpretation of what God looked like. When we put them next to one another, we can see the image at the left is this really young guy, but he is very decked out in vestments and jewels. The crown at his feet, the three-tiered uh, papal crown that he's wearing, the scepter in his hand, all really kind of constitute the wealth of the nation that produced this. And in the 1400s, Northern Europe was very, very wealthy. That's where that painting's from. The image at the right on the Sistine Chapel ceiling is a much older version of God. When you have older, it generally equals wiser. You can see that this God does not have any jewels on. It's also, this God has purpose. The God at the left is just kind of staring blankly out at us, but the God at the right is, first of all, flying, which flying beats sitting any day, but he's reaching out his hand to energize Adam because he's got stuff to do. He's got other, thing he, other things he needs to get done today. But we also have to move away from our Western ideas of God because we have other cultures to consider as well that artists have to create for. So what about the Hindu gods such as Brahma or Vishnu and Shiva? We have Hawaiian gods like Kekalia Moku and King Kamehameha I. Uh, he's the one that united all the Hawaiian islands under one rule, uh, prayed to this god. And this god is a lot different than the ones we've just seen. This god is starting off pissed off. He has this incredible headdress. You can see flaring nostrils, scarifications around the mouth, all the teeth showing. And when we compare it to a much more benevolent god, we can definitely see some juxtaposition between these two figures. But once again, it's the idea that artists are called upon to create objects that don't exist, the immaterial. So let's finish up with the fourth role of the artist. So now this first paragraph once again, don't worry about writing it down. I'm going to do a much easier translation for you. Artists make functional objects and structures more pleasurable. They may also imbue them with meaning. And to me, what this means is that artists make things beautiful. And I think for most of us, this is what we really need an artist to do. Because we want to look at, see, be surrounded with beautiful things. No one's going to go up to an artist and say, hey, can you make me something ugly? And when we really look at what an artist can do, it is amazing. When we have work like this beautiful kimono, uh, which dates back to the early 1700s, which is the Edo period in Japan. This is kind of like their Renaissance age. This is a handmade kimono. Uh, it's made with silk, and it was used in a stage production. So the object had to be functional, but it also had to be beautiful for the audience. So a work like this that is absolutely stunning in today's market might set you back like $150,000. These are very highly sought after artworks. And we'll look at a few other things that artists have really made beautiful. Just something as simple as a, a tapestry or a wall hanging or a vase, a tea service from the Art Deco age. And take a look at this bench from the Casa Calve, which is an apartment building in Barcelona. And this was created not by a craftsman, but by an architect. Antonio Gaudi is one of the most famous Spanish architects. 
And the work that he created was so different that he had to go through and design the furniture as well because there was nothing being manufactured that would really fit in the new kind of design that he was creating his buildings with. And this is something almost too beautiful to use. Uh, this is a salt and pepper shaker. And of course, this is the Eiffel Tower. Now, for most of us, the Eiffel Tower is considered really beautiful. This is something we want to see in our lifetimes. It's what we go to Paris for. It's one of the icons of Europe. And especially when you see it at night, all lit up, it's absolutely stunning. However, the idea of beauty changes from generation to generation, from culture to culture. And back in the day when this was first built, nobody liked it. The Eiffel Tower was supposed to last basically two years of it being built and then 20 years afterwards. So the Eiffel Tower was going to stand for the two years of the World's Fair it was built for, which was the 1889 Paris Exposition, and then another 20 years, and then disassembled. But people wanted it torn down almost immediately. From the Paris Times, there was an editorial that read, We the writers, painters, sculptors, architects, devoted lovers of the city of Paris, do protest with all our strength and all our indignation against the building in the very heart of our capital of the useless and monstrous Eiffel Tower. In fact, French government officials said that this project was more in keeping with America, where taste had not yet been well defined. It's what they said. They called it an excrescence on the French skyline. And they thought it was so tall because it was the tallest man-made structure in the world that it was disrupting weather patterns over the city. But today, of course, we want our picture taken with it. And we will have artworks that we will see, especially during the modern age, where we start to lose this fourth role of the artist, the idea of beauty gets pushed aside. And La Demoiselle de Avignon is one of those works that I will say I consider ugly. But it's by Picasso, one of the greatest artists that have ever lived. And we got to figure out, was this guy on drugs when he produced this? Or did he need drugs? It's an incredibly awful painting. But when we start looking at it and tearing it apart and breaking it down, um, we find that it really is a magnificent work and one of the most important works of modern art. The title of the work, La Demoiselle de Avignon, translates to the young ladies of Avignon. Uh, young ladies meaning courtesans or sex workers. Avignon, the street in Barcelona where all the brothels are lined up. And the scene that we're looking at is basically we are entering a brothel and the figure at the left is pulling back the curtain as we enter the room. Even though we don't see any beauty to this painting at the left, Picasso does reference beauty of the ancient world. The idea that these figures in the center are standing in what's called the standing Venus pose, where we see this a lot in Greek and Roman sculpture during the classical age. We also see it during the Renaissance. So we do have some elements of beauty being referenced here. And even in contemporary ages of pinups. A few of these figures are wearing African masks. The figures at the right particularly are wearing African masks. And during this age of the early 1900s, it was very common for those in Europe, particularly in France, to visit French colonies in North Africa 
such as Algiers and Tangiers, Morocco. And Picasso, even though he's a Spanish artist, lived most of his life in France and also went to North Africa. And he definitely saw these African masks, utilized these in his paintings, making his paintings very much a hybrid type of art form. The image at the left, the figure there, is not wearing an African mask, but an Iberian mask. And we know this because from Picasso's own diary, he said he had gone to an Iberian exhibition at the Louvre. Down below, we have a still life. And this is one of the very first things you would learn how to paint in a painting class. It is the very first rung of the hierarchy uh, hierarchy of painting. So this image also kind of references that painting process and painting history. The image at the right, more, a tra more of a traditional still life, a collection of inanimate objects, usually a bowl of fruit or a vase of flowers. But what this painting does is it really shows a new way of thinking about the world. The idea that photography has been invented. We no longer need an artist to document the world. We have better devices to do that with. And what Picasso does is he focuses in on line, on shape, on color, and he really focuses on what we're gonna know as the formal elements. So if you're taking Art 101, an intro class with me, um, that is what we're going to be studying next. And by the way, this is La Damoiselle de Avignon at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It's about an eight and a half foot tall, eight foot wide painting. We'll talk about that more as the semester progresses. But the next lecture in my intro to art class is the language of art. And if you're taking other classes, such as survey, uh, you'll go on into your own survey sections, uh, such as either prehistoric art or Renaissance art of the 1300s, if you're taking survey two with me. And with that, I will see you all in the next lecture.